So it is with great pleasure I want to introduce Dr. Melanie Penner. So Dr. Melanie Penner is a developmental pediatrician. She's also assistant professor at the Department of Pediatrics at University of Toronto. Um, and I'm honored to be her colleague. She's one of the brightest people I know. So um, she has agreed to, you guys sent us a lot of questions about puberty, um, both in the registration for this meeting, but also on the feedback from last year's meeting. So we thought we would dedicate one session to puberty issues. So Dr. Melanie Penner. Thank you, Abdikia. Okay, yeah, so you, you asked the PON data set for one puberty-related question, and this is your reward um, to answer puberty questions <laughs> for a whole bunch of parents. Um, so, so here we are, and we're going to talk about puberty. I want you to just take a moment, maybe close your eyes if it helps. Think back to a time in your life when you felt your most confident. You were finally comfortable in your own skin. You had a good sense of your strengths and your not so strengths. You had an idea of where you were go going in life. Maybe you haven't hit this point yet. That's okay. <laughs> uh, I, well, um, if you did think of a point in your life where, where you kind of met those, those feelings, my guess is that it wasn't between the ages of 10 and 16. Um, <laughs> so with, uh, with that, um, that perspective in mind, and, and um, I hope that we can apply a bit of grace in our own understanding of puberty in um, neurodevelopmental disorders. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being part of POND. Um, and um, thank you to Evdakia and her tremendous team for running such a um, uh, really revolutionary program of research. Um, and there will be some POND results in here from um, some of those awkward puberty questions that you have answered. Um, so in, in kind of um, preparing this, so I'm an, I'm an autism doc, I do a lot of autism stuff, and I also am a Twitter addict, and so um, when I started putting together some talks on puberty, I decided to, um, to ask my, ask the Twitterati um, what they thought. So there's this cool hashtag called Asking Autistics. Um, and they, these are some of the answers that I got back uh, when I said, what should I include in a puberty talk? Periods are a sensory nightmare and hormones can cause more meltdowns. Think about the language you use and avoid using euphemisms. I'd add extra emphasis to the message that body changes are totally expected. It's not possible to die from blood loss when you get your period, which is not something that I thought people would be worried about. I think some explanation on how hormones can affect the body would be useful. All I got was to talk about my period, but I didn't understand why suddenly the boys were stronger and faster than me. Me neither, Daria. Okay. <clears throat> so what I want to talk about today, some typical developmental tasks of puberty that, that we've all been through, and how these might differ um, in the case of neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, what are some mood and behavior changes in puberty? And um, for this, we will actually dip a bit into some of the PON data that we're analyzing. Um, dealing with menstrual management, and I think along with that goes contraception. And um, a bit about gender and sexuality. <clears throat> okay, so an overview of puberty. So this is from my pediatrics textbook. It's called Nelson's. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with it. Um, and so we have early adolescence being those 10 to 13 uh, years and middle adolescence 14 to 16. Um, and you can see that puberty comes with biological, social, and behavioral changes. And it is actually a sensitive period for organization in the brain as well that can have impl implications for long-term um, brain function and behavior. Um, so this is kind of how we go through puberty. So um, at first sexual interest is greater than activity, but then in the middle adolescence that's when sexual drive surges. Um, <clears throat> we start out with kind of very rigid 
thinking um, in those early adolescent years and then move to more abstract thought. Um, Self-concept is at first very concerned about how the body is changing and then becomes more concerned about how that body becomes attractive to other people. Um, the family, so there, there are, you know, um, bids for independence, um, kind of some shaky bids for independence at first and then a more of a struggle for autonomy as people move into middle adolescence. Um, with peers at first in early adolescence, there's, a, there, there's that like same sex or same gender cliques, lots of conformity, and then into moving into middle adolescence, that's when the dating thing starts to come in. And then in society, middle school adjustment, we, um, and then um, moving into adolescence a bit more about kind of thinking long term about what are my skills, what are the opportunities for me. Okay, so how does this work in neurodevelopmental disorders? Okay, it's the same things, but with some, uh, I think, interesting um, considerations. Um, so many of these areas may already be challenging for a child with neuro neurodevelopmental disorders. They may already be more self-conscious due to recognizing um, their neurodevelopmental difference compared to other children. They may wish to have more independence, but there might be additional concerns that prevent that um, compared to their typically developing peers. Conformity may already be a challenge. And then I cannot think of a worse transition than middle school, <laughs> personally. Um, so lots of, you know, big, busy hallways, lockers, noise, um, a whole lot of stuff going on. So that's just in early adolescence. Man, when we get to middle adolescence, then, you know, we've got, a, we've got things that are supposed to be coming out like this abstract thought. But what if you have a learning disability that makes comprehension a bit more difficult, that makes um, processing a bit more difficult, that may make abstract thought more difficult? Um, that struggle for autonomy, again, may or may not um, um, be appropriate and you have to think about um, what are the safety implications of um, giving you a bit more independence. <laughs> Dating is, uh, is a huge social communication um, uh, hurdle um, and may be impacted by social skills. And then opp uh, opportunities may be different than for their peers, which can also cause some difficulty with conformity. Um, man, I tried to look into the research about this and, um, I, and emerged a few hours later um, not feeling any more educated. Um, <laughs> So um, the big issue with the research um, is that we have a lot of um, studies of really small groups and lots of variability in the results. Um, so there's some work saying um, that there's a higher risk, but when you look at the actual amount of risk, it's a small risk of early puberty in neurodevelopmental disorders versus another study saying no difference in, in timing of puberty in autism. Um, there's described deterioration um, in behavior in autism and Down syndrome. Um, and in fact, um, autistic adolescent girls may be more likely than other groups to have behavior issues related to their menses. And yet, another study says that though parental concerns were high, most minimally verbal autistic girls coped quite well. Um, in ADHD, the classic symptoms of ADHD decrease, but there's a risk of academic failure and substance abuse. And I was kind of left um, feeling a bit like my pal MacGyver here. <laughs> um, I just, I, I, I realized that if I tried to summarize all of this information for you um, in, in one talk, we'd probably be here all day. Um, so, um, with those caveats that, that our literature is not as well developed, it's in its early adolescence perhaps, um, as, uh, as we would like, let's um, try to stick to some um, kind of more practical um, uh, aspects of this. So, one thing that we frequently hear in the clinic is her, his, their behavior is getting worse, must be puberty. Um, many times when we really dig into that, what we're starting to find is that the behavior itself may not be changing, but certain things, um, like certain other things may be changing, like the child is getting bigger, 
Um, it, hit, it hurts a bit more if they are using physical aggression. Um, you can't just pick them up and throw them in the car anymore. <laughs> um, and so what we do in those situations is go back to what we call our ABCs of behavior. So A is, a, is antecedent, and that's sort of a fancy way of saying everything that's coming before the behavior comes on. Um, so environment is a big thing here. What's happening in, in that person's environment? Um, are, if the child has sensory needs, are there sensory things that are kind of contributing to that, say in that busy middle school environment, for instance? Um, with the behavior, again, has it actually changed or does it seem to be getting worse as, just as a function of size? And then the consequences, so how is the school dealing with the behavior? How are you dealing with the behavior at home and has anything changed? So I, I, the ABCs are my mantra. I repeat them to calm myself and to kind of go back there and think about what might be going on. But his behavior is getting worse. It must be puberty. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> so going back to some of these things again, um, you know, there, there is um, concern with being more self-conscious, trying to get more independence, um, increased um, pressure to conform and, and difficulties with social isolation, perhaps if you're not conforming. Um, and then, man, that big middle school transition. Um, so there are lots of reasons, indeed, why um, behavior may be getting worse in puberty. Oh, and also sexual interest, that too. Oh, yeah, there we go, okay. Um, so let's dig in a little bit to what some of the data from um, Pond has been telling us so far. Um, so we don't have information for all of um, the, the neurodevelopmental disorders represented in Pond yet, um, but this is what we have. So we have um, data for ASD, ADHD, OCD, and typically developing controls. And we have the stages that we've divided into pre-puberty and puberty. This is the, what we're looking at for externalizing behavior. So that's the things like aggression, that's yelling, swearing, those types of things. So what do we see? Um, so first of all, there is a pre-puberty difference that's present um, with males tending to show higher pre-puberty levels of externalizing behavior. When we look at the levels of externalizing behavior between the pre-puberty um, kids and the puberty age kids, we're actually not seeing a statistically significant difference. So any of the differences that you're seeing here might kind of be interesting trends, but we can't rule out the, that it's just due to chance. Um, it is, uh, the trends are kind of interesting and I think it would be neat to kind of look and see oh, if we follow kids over a period of time if this were to um, be the case. But for males, um, perhaps a trend toward decreasing externalizing behavior and then an interesting perhaps trend of um, increasing um, externalizing behavior for females. Again, we can't say that this goes beyond chance. All right, so here's our sulky teenager who's uh, representing internalizing behavior. So um, this is kind of that anxious, withdrawn behavior. Um, and um, what we see here is that across the board, everyone increases in internalizing behavior um, across um, from, um, or at least the levels are higher from the pre-puberty um, to puberty. So kids who are in puberty, tended to report, or their caregivers reported, higher levels of internalizing behavior. Um, so we found that in particular for the girls, um, that was where we saw a statistically significant jump between um, the scores in pre-puberty compared to puberty. Um, and it's interesting that the typically developing girls also showed that same jump. But what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that um, even though the degree of the jump is the same, um, the people who are starting out in ASD and ADHD are having, and OCD also just kind of 
missed that statistical significance. Um, they're starting out at higher levels of internalizing behavior to begin with, right? So even though the amount that they increase is the same in typically developing populations, where you end up in your internalizing behavior is that much higher if you're in one of those groups with ASD, ADHD, um, and OCD. All right. So that's what we've kind of drilled out of the um, pond data so far, and there will hopefully be more to come. Ah, uterus. Um, okay, so <laughs> let's talk a bit about menstrual management and contraception because these are, um, again, frequent um, <clears throat> questions that we get in clinic. Um, more on the contraception side, the Canadian Pediatric Society actually recently came out with a new guideline on contraception which recommended long-acting reversible contraception, or what they call LARC, as first line. Um, I am not paid by uh, Morena or their the pharmaceutical company. This was just kind of a nice image that I found online um, to show how um, an example of LARC, which is, um, this is an intrauterine device or IUD. It's found to be more effective than other hormonal methods and it takes the um, burden of remembering to take a pill every day, um, for instance, out of the equation. That said, um, the, the guideline says that providers should work with youth to select the right method for them. And so with this, there is an insertion procedure and I think with that, um, there is a consent and assent um, process that, um, that the provider and the family goes through. Um, or the provider and the youth themselves if they are able to consent for themselves. Um, so across different guidelines, so when we look at the adult dis developmental disabilities primary care guidelines, um, they don't make a specific recommendation. They just say that we should discuss um, all of the different methods with women with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their caregivers, um, considering safety, effectiveness, the patient's health circumstances, um, their views on the benefits and burdens. There's a study from Ontario from a group, um, the um, Gynae group at SickKids, where they did a chart review for adolescents with developmental disabilities. And the caregiver concerns, which might sound familiar, menstrual suppression, um, so wanting to stop the periods from happening, hygiene, caregiver burden, and menstrual symptoms. And the chosen methods in their clinic, so continual, continuous OCP, or oral contraceptive pill, birth control pill, um, was over 40%. 20% um, chose a patch that kind of slowly releases um, the hormones. Um, almost 15% chose expectant management. So um, in the end, they decided to, once the period started, they, they actually said, you know what, we can deal with this. Um, DMPA was used um, a bit less, so that's Depo-Provera. That's um, a needle every three months. There are concerns with Depo-Provera and bone density in particular, so it is falling out of favor a bit. And then in um, under 3%, they had the a LARC system or the Mirena um, intrauterine um, device. Um, I looked at another survey of adolescents with ASD. Um, and mostly caregivers reporting. And again, there's a high rate of um, taking hormonal contraception, and many of them are taking it continuously. So that continues to stop you from getting the periods. Um, one third did have worsening behavior around the time of menses, and there were, there were, as you would expect, hygiene issues, needing help with blood stains, rem reminders to change a pad or tampon, and disposing of used products. Um, the most common treatments were ibuprofen and acetaminophen, and the authors actually thought those, that hormonal treatments, um, like oral contraception pills um, or a patch, were underused to help manage menstrual symptoms. So this group from SickKids um, has um, discussed their, their kind of considerations for choices around this. So um, there's sort of the degree of impairment. Um, and the required assistance that um, that person is going to require, um, how they have, like how they're dealing with their menstrual associated symptoms, whether they have contraindications to estrogen, and so that's like if you've had a stroke before, if you have heart disease, then there are different, you may not be a good fit for that. 
concerns for bone density. Um, so in particular, if you're not weight bearing, if you were in a wheelchair, for instance, uh, there's a higher risk of fractures and you may not want to take one of those um, Depo-Provera needles in that case. Other comorbidities, the root and, frequ and frequency of administration. So um, in particular, if you are using this for contraception, if you have a kid um, who is not the best at remembering things, um, that may not um, be the best option for that child um, if the goal is preventing pregnancy. And then what the individual preferences are. Okay. Let's talk a bit about gender. So I will say I included gender in this talk, but gender is not specifically an issue of puberty. Um, so um, people can express different gender identities at different points throughout their life. Um, but it seemed like something worth mentioning here. The research has been limited to date, um, but there is a lot of buzz out there about higher rates of gender dysphoria, particularly in autism. Um, so there was a study from the Netherlands um, which showed that less than 1% of their ASD sample identified as something other than their biological sex. Um, and this was a bit higher in women um, com uh, compared to men. And there, they said that this link may be present in other neurodevelopmental disorders and specifically mentioned ADHD. Regardless, I think we still have work to do to figure out if this link is really occurring um, at a higher rate than in the typically developing population. But regardless of whether it's a higher risk, um, children and youth with neurodevelopmental disorders deserve the same rate or the same range of gender affirming interventions um, as their neurotypical peers. All right, sexuality. Um, people with neurodevelopmental disorders experience sexuality, and that is okay. Um, the only thing that I raise as a possible flag here is that if it is occurring um, with certain other red flags, and we'll talk about those a bit later, there, you, you do have to have a higher suspicion um, just because of the risk of um, abuse. Um, that, okay, that caveat out of the side. So let's, let's talk about masturbation. Masturbation is normal and expected. Um, it is one of these things that occurs not along kind of the developmental um, trajectory that we might associate with someone's cognitive development, um, but, um, but is a physiological thing that people do. In fact, it may be an issue if it's not occurring, and I have had cases in my clinic where uh, we have to ask very um, detailed questions about um, whether it's happening and whether it's happening to completion because um, you may um, put together that there could be some frustration if that process is not completed. Um, where, it, um, where some extra attention may be required is around teaching privacy. Um, so this is where a behavior therapist could come in or use, use of visuals may be helpful in terms of um, directing kids to um, a safe and private place to engage in masturbation. And there are some resources out there. Um, so handmade love is for um, sort of male genitalia and fingertips is for f uh, female genitalia. Okay, so sexuality, um, let's continue this discussion. So <clears throat> along with the gender um, discussion, there's also been um, some uh, discussion as to whether um, non-hetero um, sexual preferences are more common in neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, so another study from the Netherlands, half of their participants with ASD in their sample, now this is their sample who can reply to a survey, so may not be representative of all people with ASD, were in a relationship, and many lived with their partner. And they did seem to have a bit more variation in sexual orientation compared with neuro neurotypical controls. Um, and a higher proportion that were not exclusively attracted to members of the opposite sex, uh, particularly among women. So again, the same way that um, perhaps in the, the um, sample uh, around gender, women seem to have a bit more non-conforming um, views. They may have as well um, more um, non-hetero um, relationship preferences or sexual preferences. Okay. 
Um, I do want to flag this because I, I, I think it's important. So there is, um, unfortunately, an increased risk of um, abuse and including sexual abuse among young people um, with neurodevelopmental disorders or chronic health conditions. Um, so it is important to maintain a high level of suspicion and some things that may be flags include behavior changes, um, sexualized behavior, and you'll have to kind of judge whether this is um, a typical kind of progression of sexual behavior or if there are cons other concerning features with it. Um, somatic complaints, um, so starting to complain of headaches or tummy aches, um, and copresis, so if there is sudden um, development of um, of bowel um, accidents and avoiding specific caregivers or situations. Um, so um, as a provider, what I try to do is discuss the limits of confidentiality and try to keep this appropriate to the developmental level. And here are some helpful practices that I think um, you can watch out for for your health providers. So um, promoting privacy and draping Encourage um, your children to self-report, um, so to empower them to talk about their own health symptoms. Uh, making sure that physical examinations and procedures are chaperoned. Um, and providing appropriate information about healthy sexuality um, anatomy, so giving in particular um, proper terms for um, genitalia and other body parts and personal rights. Okay, so some take home points. Behaviors may indeed get worse in puberty, and, but this is, it, it, the stressors are some of this, uh, the same as typical developmental tasks of puberty. Um, existing behaviors um, may become more difficult to manage. Um, and internalizing behavior in particular, kind of that sulky, sad, withdrawn, anxious um, behavior may worsen, and that uh, worsening um, seems to impact girls in particular. There are lots of options for menstrual management, and that includes expectant management, so waiting and seeing how things go and how you can manage it. Um, there may be increased gender dysphoria in neurodevelopmental disorders, and um, it is something to be aware of um, and um, let your healthcare provider know, and they can hopefully send you in the right direction. Um, people with neurodevelopmental disorders experience sexuality, um, and it, that includes non-heterosexuality. And we should be um, uh, ready to provide increased vigilance and empowering practice um, to make sure that we're keeping um, our adolescents um, safe. And that's all I've got for you today. I am nervous but happy to take questions. <laughs> yep, uh, Greg Hoodie. <laughs> Sorry, yep. So, um, so, question for you. In the first chart, you talked about the, the um, changes that occur in uh, neurological development and, and um, non. Um, does the timing of some of the more um, uh, extroverted and introverted uh, changes occur differently? For example, so you, know, you talked about masturbation, and that's a physiological change that's going to occur, I would assume, the same age. What about things like interest in the opposite sex and the whole peer issues that you're talking about? You know, for example, I have a 12 year old son with idiot um, with autism. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. you know, I should expect the kind of societal changes to occur later because of his, you know, maturity level is not the same as a typical. Level. Right, so some of that definitely depends on, on what their own understanding of those social situations is, which may be um, different than their peers. Um, and so some of those less physiologic changes definitely um, can, be, um, can be either coming later or, or they may not um, kind of, they may not, whoops, sorry, get to, the, to that point um, where they are, you know, for instance, super concerned about conformity. Um, so that is kind of one of the areas where things may differ depending on um, that person's kind of social um, understanding and, um, you know, there are cognitive inputs to, to kind of that process as well. Anyone else? Yep.
I, I love that comment. I think that's so nice. If you couldn't hear that, that was sort of um, reflecting on things like slamming the bedroom door as, as a positive thing, like, oh, she's becoming a teenager. And, um, and yeah, so, you know, it is part of developing your independence from your, from your parents. Um, and it's awkward and painful for everyone, but um, I, love, I love your positive perspective. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he's very interested in friends and has a friend network. And uh, he says, he always says, I'm too young for that. I don't want to do that. Or, and I try to respect mm -hmm. his readiness. I obviously don't want to push him, sign him up on dating sites or anything like that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Um, so I love the idea of just following his lead um, and um, and also you know creating a very open atmosphere for that dialogue to occur um, I, I think it's just beautiful and and exactly what you should be doing but I don't think there's any need to kind of push those those you know relationships or anything if the desire you know isn't really there to kind of Send them to mixers or <laughs> Maybe Pond should host some mixers. Um, <laughs> yes. I think um, that my general threshold is when is this causing difficulty in day-to-day -day life? So um, is this causing difficulty in getting out the door in the morning? Um, are there new problems at school that are arising um, as a result of, say, depression or anxiety? Um, you know, do you still participate in activities? Um, so there is certainly like a, a clinical threshold that we can hit where we should say, yes, let's think about perhaps cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety um, or, or for depression or whether you know, we need to seek out um, a, a medication to help with this. Um, so though kind of those that increase may be expected, like I said, particularly for our kids with neurodevelopmental disorders, they're starting from a higher place already, and that increase may sort of actually kick them into to a level where we need to be more cognizant of actually providing treatment for the internalizing behavior. Yes. Um, so I'm not aware of anything really specific about that, and Avdiki, I'll look in your direction if you, yeah. I think, and again, I really think that the best kind of approach is, um, you know, going, taking your child's lead, and the nice thing is that hopefully as they, as they do mature a bit more, 
Um, the hope is that with those empowering practices, they'll be able to tell you a bit more um, about whether they think that they need more help, whether they think they're interested um, in medications. Now, that might not be the case yet, but, um, but encouraging them to move towards making some of those decisions for themselves um, as well in the future um, is a nice way to help them take more control um, over their health care. Yes, Connie. Uh huh. That you put up. And, um, is there, as, as you come across your, your, in your world of, of this area, are, is there a network of, say, frontline primary care physicians that are sensitive or trained or really appreciate the transition hmm. to that place of being really able to deal with some of those things with both? Um, boys and girls or men and women as as our kids are getting older and mm -hmm. they, want, they want to take charge of their own decisions mm -hmm. and yet they still need to feel they don't want their mom in the room basically but they still need to feel like they can talk to somebody who really gets mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. and are there those people out there <laughs> So um, there are, I know that we are getting some more adolescent medicine um, physicians who, who have more of an interest in our populations. Um, and um, there are probably, I don't know, Eptikia, do you know of? Yeah, I, I think it's it's an area where we need to do a bit better, though, in terms of making sure that we also get the, the non-intellectual um, disability population covered, too. So um, hopefully we'll have more capacity in the future. Last one. Oh, yeah, back there. Oh, I love Garth. Well, me too. <laughs> he is, um, yes, pediatric uh, uh, He's a developmental, he's the reason I became a developmental pediatrician. Okay. Um, and he says that there's a window of opportunity, age 6 to 12, and that's when we need to find out the um, behavioral issues and, and tweak them, find out how to help them, and, and meet the needs by 12. Otherwise, then I do so so yeah I mean I think there's still it's not as if all hope is lost if you've if you've made it to age 12 and things aren't perfect but um, but I, I do I do think that that there is um, a nice opportunity to get into good behavioral habits earlier on before you end up in that situation where you where you've got like a really suddenly a, a big teenager on your hands and then you're you're like oh we this doesn't this doesn't work anymore because of your size so so it is yeah oh no i'm seeing more hands but i think we're cutting it we off i'm yeah, really sorry <laughs>
question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yep. Um, yeah, so the Geneva Center um, for Autism does have, and you said your son has autism? Yes. Yeah, okay, so the Geneva Center does have um, parent workshops, and um, I'm not sure, he may still be too young for their, um, their kind of kids or teens um, um, groups that they sometimes run, but there are definitely parent workshops. And if that's a goal that you want to work on with um, your ABA therapist um, through the Ontario Autism Program, I think that's also something that you could pick as a goal for a block of ABA therapy to sort of teach privacy, for instance. Um, so, so yeah, those are the ones that come to mind. Yes. Yeah, so it's a really good point that, that you know, parents have to take the time to take care of themselves um, because these are, I often like to say, you know, these are extreme parenting situations. Um, I, unfortunately, I'm an autism doctor and I'm a bit more familiar with the, the parent kind of resources in that community, um, but I'm wondering if any of the yeah, yeah, um, ADHD parent uh, resources or Can parent you shoot groups. Can you email? 